What's up my pre cog people, Michael Princhuk here. Before we begin this video, don't forget to hit that subscribe button, it helps me out a lot. Now this video is over practice multiple choice questions to make sure you are gonna be ready for the AP Pre-Calculus exam. Now this is part one of a few videos I'm gonna have that do these practice multiple choice questions. Now here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna watch the video, when a question pops up, you're gonna hit pause. You're gonna try the question on your own and hit play to see the answer. Now, if you get the answer correct, feel free to just move on to the next question or keep watching as I explain how to do the question. All right, these questions are designed to be very similar to ones on the actual AP Pre-Calculus exam. That way you're doing some really good quality practice. But if you want some more good quality practice, please check out the ultimate review packet for AP Pre-Calculus. In that ultimate review packet, there are two full length practice exams with 28 multiple choice questions where you can use, cannot use a calculator, excuse me, 12 where you can and four free response questions designed to be just like the AP exam. And then there's a second um, full week practice exam as well with another 40 multiple choice questions and four free response. And you can also check out the ultimate exam slayer that's built to look just like the actual AP exam in Blue Book. And it has another set of multiple choice questions and four free response. So if you're looking to do more, check those out. But let's dive into some practice multiple choice questions right now. All right, let's get started right away with question number one. So here it is. And the answer is B. This function is always increasing at an increasing rate. Now, the best way to see that is to simply just, you know, get out a scrap paper and graph a couple points. So what we see here is that if we graph some of these points, they are getting bigger, right? 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, 96. They're clearly increasing, but the rate at which they're increasing is also increasing. And that's because it's getting bigger by 3. 3 to 6 is plus 3. 6 to 12 is plus 6. 12 to 24 is plus 12. 24 to 48 is plus 24. Again, it's getting bigger at that increasing rate. And if you make a quick graph like I have here, you can also see that it's concave up. And you should note this point that concave up means the rate of change is increasing. All right, question number two, here it is. All right, and the correct answer is D. F is always increasing at a decreasing rate. We clearly see from left to right, the values are going up. It's pretty obvious that the function values are increasing, but notice how the graph is concave down. That means the rate of change is decreasing. In the very beginning, we're getting big very, very quickly. Look how fast that rate of change is. And then it starts to slow down. And as the graph continues, the rate of change starts to slow down. And that's because the graph is concave down. So D is the correct answer. All right, let's tackle question number three. And the correct answer is D. Now, this is a classic composition problem. Definitely going to be compositions on the um, AP pre-calc exam at some point. So here we have a composition function defined as G or F composed of G. So we're going to put G into F and they want us to find the value of H of 2. So all we have to do is start slow. Plug 2 into G first. And if we plug 2 into G, we're looking here and we see that here is an input of 2. And with G, the output is negative 2. So there it is right there. And now that output becomes the input to F. And here is the input negative 2. And with F, that gives us negative 8. So there's our final answer of negative 8. Hopefully that one's pretty easy. And here is question number 4. All right, and the correct answer is B. So basically, this is very similar to the previous question. A couple of the numbers are a little bit different, but this time we're not asked to plug a value into the composition function. We're asked to find, we're asked to solve it. We're trying to figure out when does H of X equal six. So we've got to think backwards a little bit here, and here's why B is the correct answer. If we start with zero, if we plug zero in, we have to plug it into G first. So the output is two. So G of zero equals two. So that output of two now becomes the input for F. And if we plug two into F, we get six. So there's that six we want right there. And that's why B is the correct answer. Uh, C and D have negative five. And if you plug negative five in, it doesn't result in six. And A, the logic doesn't make sense because they're trying to say to plug zero into F first. And no, you plug uh, zero into G first following the rules of the composition function there. So hopefully that one makes a lot of sense. All right, and question number five, here it is. And the correct answer here is B. 
the graph is exactly one whole at x equals negative 2. Now this can be a little bit tricky because we have vertical asymptotes and holes and some students have a hard time understanding them. Now a lot of kids learn that holes are values that make both the numerator and the denominator zero, but that's not always the case if we have multiplicities on some of those zeros. So we take a look here, first off we see that we have x plus 2 on both the numerator and the denominator, so we definitely have a hole at x equals negative 2, both of those have the same multiplicities. But with the x minus 1, we have a multiplicity of 2 on the bottom, and that's bigger. When the multiplicity is bigger on the bottom, that's going to create a vertical asymptote at x equals 1. So we do not have a hole at 1, we have a vertical asymptote at 1. So that's the key thing there. Now, if, let's see here, let's say that there was a 2 on this x plus 2, so that was an x plus 2 squared. Now the multiplicity is bigger on top, that would still produce a hole at negative 2. So you going to be very, very careful with that. You can't just say, hey, if you make the top and bottom 0, you're a hole, because that's not always the case. If the multiplicity is bigger in the bottom, that's going to be a vertical asymptote. So the only hole in this graph is at x equals negative 2. All right, in question number 6, And the correct answer here is D. Now this is a classic transformation question. So let's first make sure we understand the transformations taking place. First, we have a three on the outside. A three on the outside is gonna multiply our Y's by three. That's a vertical dilation. So it's gonna multiply your outputs by three. So if I have an output of negative five, it's gonna multiply that by three and it's gonna become negative 15. Now on the inside, we have a minus two. That's gonna be a horizontal translation, but this is where you gotta be careful. It says minus two, but that actually means to the right two. On the inside, it's gonna do the opposite. Hopefully you learned that in class. So we have to be careful not to subtract two from our x, but we're gonna add two. So if we have the three right here, that was our input, our x value, we add two, we get five. So that's why our final answer is five comma negative 15. So be very, very, very careful, especially with that inside. A lot of kids will get tricked and they'll put C as the correct answer because they subtract two, not remembering that that C value on the inside is the opposite of what it says. All right, let's start off with question number seven. Here it is. And the correct answer here is B. This is actually a pretty easy one that everybody should be able to get right. All we have to know is the definition of a log. So the base of the log is 4. So if we're going to turn this into an exponential equation. That's our base. Logs equal the exponent. Whatever a log equals is your exponent. So the 5 is my exponent. And the W on the inside is, of course, what that exponential function is going to equal. So we have 4 raised to the 5th equals W. All right, let's talk about question number 8. Here it is. And the correct answer here is A. Now this is a really good question that confuses a lot of kids. Let's walk through it. So the number of that bacteria in the Petri dish triples every seven hours. So every seven hours it's going to triple. So after seven hours, 14 hours, 21 hours, 28 hours, you get the point. Now there are 25 bacteria cells at the beginning, time equals zero. Which of the following is the appropriate model? Now here's what we know, and hopefully you know this. This can eliminate C and D right away. Exponential models are when you're going to multiply at a consistent rate, or you're going to multiply, 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 multiply proportionally. So we have A times B raised to the X. So hopefully that's pretty simple, right? That we know that C and D are going to be wrong. Now the A value is going to be the initial value when your time, in this case, equals zero. So that's how we know there's going to be 25 right there. And then the B is the rate at which we're changing, and that rate is, of course, we're tripling, right? So we're multiplying by three. Now here's the tricky thing you have to understand is it's happening every seven hours. So T represents hours. So I need to take my hours and divide by seven. Why? Well, because if I plug in seven for T after seven hours, seven divided by seven is one. So that's gonna triple me one time. And after seven hours, it triples one time. If I plug in 14 for T, 14 divided by seven is two. So I'm gonna triple twice. So I'm gonna do three times another three. So you're going to be very careful to understand that because it's not tripling every one hour, if it was tripling every one hour, then we would just have T in our exponent, we'd be done. It's happening every seven hours, so I have to divide my time by seven to get the, the length of time for a triple. And length of time for triple, one triple, right? One triple is seven. So that's why we got to divide that by seven. So hopefully a little bit tricky one, but you know, if you look at B, and some kids might choose B as their correct answer, if I plug in one, meaning one hour, 
That's going to multiply by seven and turn that into seven hours. Whoa, 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 whoa. That would be seven triples. I mean, triple, 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 triple. That's not what's happening. It's tripling every seven hours. So that's why we got to divide. So hopefully that one's not too bad. And here's question number nine. And the correct answer here is C. Now, this is a question that's going to involve some good old-fashioned solving with trigonomic equations. It's actually not too bad if you know a couple of the basic rules. And if you don't, hopefully this is going to review them right now. So we have an equation that models the number of deer, and we want to figure out when it's going to equal 620. So all we got to do is start off by, well, letting it equal 620. Now, here's all my work showing you how I solved this. Let me walk you through it. The first thing I did was I subtracted the 600 over, and that's pretty easy math, and we get 20. The next thing I'm going to do is divide by 40, the opposite of multiply right here. We're multiplying. We're going to divide by 40. 20 divided by 40 is a half. Now, the T I'm trying to solve for is inside of the sign. So to get rid of it, I need to get rid of the sign, which means I've got to use an inverse sign. So the inverse sign of 1 half equals pi over 12. I call it the old switcheroo. I want to switch my input with my output. And to do that, I need the inverse sign. So I have the inverse sine of 1 half equals pi over 12 times t. Now, hopefully you know your inverse sines and your inverse cosines, but inverse sine is pi over 6. Remember, an inverse is looking for an angle. So I'm looking for an angle where the y coordinate from the unit circle is 1 half. So here's a y coordinate of 1 half on the unit circle, and that's going to happen right here at pi over 6. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, does that also happen over here at 5 pi over 6? Yes. But remember, the limitations on inverse sine is up to pi over 2 or down to negative pi over 2. So I'm actually not even allowed to go into quadrant 2. So the only answer to that inverse sine is pi over 6. All right, now we have to get rid of the pi over 12 to solve for t. And I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, which is 12 over pi. That's going to get the pi's to cancel, the 12's to cancel. Do that on both sides. On the left-hand side, I also multiply by 12 over pi. Pi's cancel, and I get six. Excuse me, 12 over 6, which is 2 for my final answer. So that's a really good problem, and hopefully you know how to solve trigonomic equations like that one. All right, question number 10. Here it is. All right, the correct answer here is A. Now, this is a really good polar function problem. So we have the polar function 3 sine theta. Okay, cool. Now, they want to figure out what portion of the graph is created when looking at values for theta between pi and 3 pi over 2. Now, pi to 3 pi over 2 is down here in quadrant 3. Okay, so why is A the answer? A lot of kids are going to answer D is correct because that's the area that it asks about. No, we got to be really, really careful here. Remember, in quadrant 3, sine values are negative. Sine values are negative, right? All these y coordinates from the unit circle are going to be negative down here. And when you multiply by the 3, they're still going to be negative. Now, in the polar world, negative radiuses make you reflect across the pole. So any value that's going to be constructed down here, because it ends up having a negative output or a negative radius when we create this or when we solve for the polar value, it's going to put it into quadrant 1. So that's why the correct answer there is A. And if you don't believe me, you know, you could go ahead and try some values out. Like, you know, any, you know, do 5 pi over 4. 5 pi over 4 is right about here. If I plug it in, I'm going to get negative radical 2 over 2 times it by 3. I'm going to get a negative value. And in the polar world, when you are when you are at an angle, right, here's 5 pi over 4, but you get a negative radius, then that reflects you across the pole into quadrant 1. So that's why A is the correct answer. Values from pi to 3 pi over 2 are going to end up being drawn in quadrant 1, which is choice A.